Because every good story ends with one. Ends with what, you're wondering? Well, every good story, like a good story, like the kind of story where if you heard it, you'd say, my God, that was good. They all invariably end with a very specific, a very particular, uh, but a very common uh, sexual act, the name of which I'm avoiding saying uh, because of all the names of all the sexual acts in the human playbook, the name of this sexual act has got to be hands down the silliest, which of course makes it the lamest. You don't want your sexual acts having silly uh, names. And the name of this sexual act, it, it so completely fails to describe the actions involved in the sexual act that, if anything, it, it describes the opposite of the actions involved and does so in words that are both uninspired and uninspiring words that lack any shred of sexual appeal while at the same time literally claiming that when you perform this sexual act all you are doing is just your job which i understand for many spouses male and female i hear that it can seem that way to attempt any sort of serious discussion no matter how near or dear to your heart the topic is rendered impossible at the utterance of the name of this sexual act. It lets the air out of any conversation of any import, which is not necessarily a lament. In fact, I have used this very quality to my advantage. Some might say to my detriment. I will let you decide. I had just uttered the name of this sexual act to uh, my three uh, proto-friends in their rented apartment. I say proto-friends because they were not, as of yet, actual friends. This was the first time we were hanging out outside of our workplace, our workplace being the Fringe Festival grounds. Uh, a Fringe Festival is a festival of independent theater, and we were at the Adelaide Fringe Festival, the second largest festival of its kind, with well over a thousand independently produced shows, each one performing every single day for a month to audiences the sizes of which were very easy to count. For me, at least, not so much for my would-be, I hope they will be friends who were not only routinely selling out their shows, but were doing so in venues much larger than uh, my own. Which is not to say that their shows were better, you know, that's a, it's a matter of taste, but it does mean to say that unlike myself, they knew what they were doing. They had people helping them. They had publicists. They had producers. They'd been to the Adelaide Fringe Festival before, unlike myself, who'd never been in Australia. I had, didn't know anybody. I had mistakenly assumed that the best venue at the Adelaide Fringe would therefore be the best venue for my show. I was wrong. Turns out that, you know, uh, when you say venue, just uh, I don't mean one room, okay? I mean a collection of venues is sort of uh, organized by this umbrella uh, group called the Garden of Unearthly Delights, which takes over this park in Adelaide and, and transforms it into a beautiful carnival full of rides and carnival tents inside of which happen all the shows with endless opportunities outside the tents to get all manner of food and even more endless if endless can ever actually be more opportunities to consume alcohol because it turns out to my surprise that the point of the theater festival, at least insofar as the Garden of Unearthly Delights was concerned, was not to showcase theater so much as it was to showcase the effects 
of alcohol on the human mind. As beautiful as the garden was, festooned with all manner of colored strings of lights, it attracted uh, an, an audience that I... Not to my personal uh, liking. So many theaters the world over lament that, that their audiences skew older. Well, not at the Garden of Unearthly Delights. It attracts m men, burly South Australian men in tight fitting t shirts with loud logos printed upon them with their dates, who physically are the opposite, petite little women, but fashionably very similar with tight outfits, and they are here to see what I call short attention span theater. They are looking to have a laugh. They're looking to see stand-up comedy. They are looking for something a little bit dangerous. Shows that wear their sexuality on their sleeve, which is to say they are looking for shows of men in drag singing songs so they can feel they've rubbed shoulders with something underground and they can take this this danger home with them after they've been out for the evening and through the catalytic converters of their nubile bodies uh, enjoy a night of sexual adventure in their homes. Uh, the, the, the one show that would interrupt this evening of slowly getting inebriated and working towards having uh, sexual relations, uh, the one show that would interrupt that, it turns out it's my own, my own show. It turns out none of them really want to see an autobiographical story about a man's uh, quest for self-discovery as he backpacked across West Africa for five months and I could see the look in their eyes as I was performing my show uh, about this very topic, the look of disappointment that was echoed by the literal carnival barkers outside the canvas walls of my venue, barkers that were enticing people to come into other venues but really were echoing the regret of those who'd come to see me. And I understand what you're hearing from me, right? This is just bitterness right now, you know? I mean, even as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm well aware that I wish I was in the audience. I wish I was on one of those dates. dates. I'm not criticizing the young men and women of Adelaide who would come to see me perform. I, I, am, I as I said, merely just regretting that I was not born in South Australia, had not been raised uh, and had not found myself in the audience of a show like mine, but not mine. Watching a performer like me, uh, but not me. Uh, and, and I felt this even as I was standing on stage performing to audiences that I wished were like them, but uh, not uh, them. The, the, the measure of a good performer, I, I just want to make this clear, is not uh, who is performing to, to sold out houses? You know, in fact, it's very easy to perform to sold out houses. No, no a, a real, true performer is the performer who can handle failure, who can, who can see that he has a month ahead of him of performing to audiences who will be looking at him with abject disappointment, is the performer who, who has the character to accept this and to look beyond his, his circus venue tent and find meaning in the experience so very far from home. And, and the meaning for me was found in meeting other performers and getting to know them and sort of exchanging this artistic energy, which is why I was so excited to be invited to come to my three, maybe, might be friends, rented apartment. As I recall that evening, we were having a fantastic time together. This was 2011. Uh, it, it, it's amazing uh, what snippets of conversation can survive 10 years of inebriance to the human mind. But I recall us laughing uproariously as we pretended to debate with the utmost seriousness what one should do if one found oneself under personal attack by a whale.
Imagine a whale has, has found you swimming out in the ocean, has clamped down on your midsection, is now dragging you hundreds of feet below the water. You are sticking out the side of its mouth, furling and unfurling like a party horn in celebration of absolutely nothing. Certainly not celebrating anything for yourself, and the whale's not celebrating either as it's sort of shaking you from side to side, not to whip you into submission, but in just a, a sign of its abject disappointment that its ancestors had not developed a taste for meat because you are such easy prey. And the debate was whether if in this situation you should muster your concentration to then punch the whale in the nose or in the eye. Knowing full well that the effects of all the water will, will render your uppercut in a sort of slow motion. And that the whale will do what any animal on this planet with an eyelid would do, which is to say, blink. And we were uh, enjoying the absurdist ramifications of this conversation. And the, the next thing I recall is uh, telling them how recently I'd gone to Bethlehem on Christmas to see the spot where Jesus Christ was born. Born. I don't even know if there was a segue between the conversation about hitting the whale in the eye and me suddenly telling them at length about my Christian upbringing, how I went to uh, the, our Catholic church every single Sunday until I graduated high school and went off to college. That's 18 years times 50 to Sundays, a number that, I, I, that we all know that is impossible to calculate without the aid of a machine. And what's remarkable is that despite this 18 times 52 different Sundays that my father brought my brother and myself to church, never once did he actually consult a schedule. Which means that we would just show up whenever, sometimes uh, with great disappointment just as Mass was beginning, but other times in moments of celebration because it was letting out as we would be arriving, meaning we could also turn around and go right back to the car and go right back home. But of course... More often than not, we would show up at some unknown point during the service. And I say unknown because we wouldn't sit in the main, the nave, the main part where the congregation would sit. We wouldn't be able to, to register the cues that might let us know where we were in the service. Instead, we always slipped in through this side door. And then we would sit in this, like, I don't even know what to call it. It's not really a room because it didn't have walls. It's, it was just sort of off uh, to the side to, to, to see the action, if that's what a priest speaking on an altar can be called. It, it, you literally had to turn around, look behind you, and off to the side, where if you were lucky, you might just catch the back slash side of the priest's invariably balding head, something you never did because, of course, the look behind you meant also looking into the eyes of the person sitting behind you in the pew. And outside that moment in a Catholic service, when you turn to your neighbor and you shake their hand and you look at them and you say, peace be with you, and they say, and also with you, you do not look at anybody else in the church at any other moment you pretend that none of them exist. So all there was to do was just, just look straight ahead, as everyone else is in the church is doing, but straight ahead for them is, is the priest. Straight ahead for us was just a wall on which there was one uh, portrait of a woman who a millennia ago managed to get pregnant and give birth without having sex 
What? Oh, it is a miracle that only uh, could occur through God's handiwork. It is one of the foundations upon which uh, the Christian church is built. And and, and yet uh, nobody, uh, I don't remember anybody uh, talking uh, in any mass about the fact that, um, well, this miracle happens all the time now with in vitro fertilization. Um, But maybe it was addressed by one of the priests. Honestly, I don't know because I never listened to a word they were saying. I always just took it on faith that they were talking about faith. And and yes, I, I, I fully understand the irony that I spent the first 18 years of my life every single Sunday attending a one-man show and and paying no attention to it whatsoever. And so how am I in any position to complain about the audiences in Adelaide? This poor man who would have to stand at the front of the church delivering his little show to a, to a large room filled with people who all understood that no matter what, do not emote do not give him anything. Just stare blankly or probably fall asleep, <laughs> you know? Uh, which I, I know it's, it's probably, when talking about your Catholicism, you shouldn't use the word karma. And yet, I understand the karma now, right? Having performed to such audiences in Adelaide, I, 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 I have sympathy now. For that priest, if I could go back in time, I'd, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd give him something, even as much as we weren't sitting in front of him, you know? I would perhaps for a moment stop thinking about the same thing that I always thought about, which was just all the different girls I had crushes on and how I was well aware that I was never going to do anything about any of them. And I didn't. Which perhaps, if I'd really thought about it, I would have made me feel a, a bit closer to the portrait of the virgin woman in front of me. But I, I didn't even put two and two together. I'm well aware that it, even as I'm saying this and sort of talking about how I never fully listened, there, there might be a whole bunch of you out there that likewise aren't really fully listening. And I, I get it. A lot going on in our lives, you know, that you might be out there kind of running through all the different people that you have had crushes on and and, and lamenting that you probably won't do anything about it, but maybe, maybe you will. Look, it's been a long year of lockdown, you know, and I don't know if if, if you are like me, but I, I, it, I'm unable to really engage uh, with any sort of fantasy if there's not a shred of possibility within it, and this past year has just rendered all possibility impossible. So I've had to, I just had to get a, get rid of anything. To, but now that things are opening up, I understand we all might be just looking through our little Rolodexes of fantasies. You're like, well, what, what, what I might be able to capitalize. And, and you might be doing that now. Why not? It's springtime. It's in the air. It's love, you know, and, and sure. Uh, and, and those of you who are fully listening to me, I'm, I'm well aware that you might be ha- having your own moment of, of, of uncertainty as you're suddenly wondering whether you've been bamboozled into watching a show about somebody's Christian upbringing. Uh, if you feel an expression sort of like uh, frozen on your face, one of, of doubt and, and regret, you know, well then freeze it. Freeze it there. Uh, quickly move around to the nearest mirror so that you can see what you look like, so you can know exactly what my three proto probably never will be friends were looking at me with the expressions that surely on your face now, all three of them, I could see them being like, oh God, 
We've invited over a Christian zealot, and I, 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 I could tell, and, and and I try to interject and say, guys, just so you know, like I'm not, I'm not religious. I'm not religious. You know what I mean? Like, oh no, 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 no. I don't even like the religion. I get why people are religious, but I'm not. You know, I get like people need it for like a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. They get to, they need to feel that there is someone out there, God, whoever you want to call it, that is like watching them, that is keeping track that is proud of them, that has sympathy and love for them, that there is meaning within the chaos that exists just beyond our collective front doors. But of course, any you know defense I'm putting up uh, of my own story that I'm not really, it's immediately undercut as, as I go on to tell them that, that despite 18 times 52 different services I attended over, over the many years, you can't help but have the stories of Christianity seep into your bones. And so it occurred to me just a few months before I was telling them this story that wouldn't it be neat to travel to the Holy Land and see the places that I've heard about all my life. And so I told them how I traveled to Nazareth, to Jesus's hometown, and how I'd walked for three days by myself following something called the Jesus Trail, following little orange circles made with spray paint on the sides of trees and stones, walking between all the towns in which Jesus is mentioned in the Bible. So I went from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee. I stood upon the spot where he delivered his sermon on the amount, the original one man show. I went to the place where he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. I stood in the location where he proved himself to be the party prophet and save that wedding by turning water into wine and getting everybody drunk. Oh, he would have been a hit at the Garden of Unearthly Delights. And then I tell them I traveled over to Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. I snuck into Christmas Eve Mass. I was surrounded by priests from all over the world who made a pilgrimage to like ground zero of this religion and their joy was infectious as I'm thinking I've made a pilgrimage too to like this the original one man show Jesus himself and I found myself walking down a flight of stairs into a small grotto a cave and on the ground there was a star that marked the spot where Jesus Christ would have been born 2010 years before this and whether you believe or you don't believe it certainly made one thing clear to me that all the time that we have spent building mangers and putting them up in the town square or in my own house growing up and populating these mangers with the menagerie of farm animals and, and kings and, and the odd Star Wars figure. A waste of time because being in this grotto makes very clear that like those are wildly inaccurate because this space literally is big enough for like two cats. And a woman who's never had sex giving birth to a baby and maybe one sort of weird, out-of-time onlooker. And as terrible as I felt g g portraying myself as someone who was into religion, as, as, as much as I thought, oh God, I, I was so much more comfortable with the conversation about hitting the whale in the eye, I, 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 I can't stop myself. And, and as terrible as that is, even worse is knowing that I'm committing uh, like the worst uh, crime that a storyteller can commit in, in that my story as I'm telling it to them has no end. I'm just describing something that happened and I can feel myself getting to the end. I'm going to leave that, that, that grotto where Jesus supposedly was born and then that's it. And nothing else is going to happen. And, and I can see the doubt and the look on their faces and I'm well aware that like I've got no conclusion. I've got no bombshell. I've got no moment where they'll be like, oh, okay, you know, and I, and I sort of just trail off, you know, and they're all looking at me like... And then Deborah, Deborah, uh, Deborah, you know, of, of Tommy Phillip and Deborah, Deborah says, uh, is that it? And I say, well, 
Well, no. I, then I got a blowjob. Which, 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 I, which I didn't, you know. Which I didn't. It's just, it's just, you know, I'm saying it to, like, let them know that, like, I, I'm, I didn't mean to take my own story so seriously. Comedy is... Uh, a difficult thing. Well, we all agree comedy is something of a mystery. We, you know, you can't really explain to someone how to be funny or why something funny. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a feeling. It's a, it's something you project out of your imagination. It's something. It's an, it's a moment of understanding with somebody else. You know, I think we all agree that comedy, it has something to do with timing, about saying the exact right thing at the exact right time. And sometimes, of course, the right thing is the exact wrong thing. But for you to get away with saying the wrong thing, you have to feel right in that the audience knows that you know that what you've said is wrong. And if they know that, then maybe, uh, they, maybe they can laugh at it. Which two-thirds of my audience of three uh, do? Uh, laugh, uh, but not uh, Deborah. Um, uh, the, the woman, surprisingly, she didn't find this uh, funny. I, I don't know. And uh, she, she says to me, "That's a terrible way to end a story." And I say to her, uh, "What?" I say, "No, no, no, no." No, it's it, it, it. No, it's not. And to be clear, she's not like offended. You know, it's not like she's a, it's like a little flower who's never heard this word before in her life, and she's like, "Oh my God!" You know, no, it's not that. She's offended. She's offended as a storyteller. She's offended, and she's like, "No, no, 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 no. Stories have to. They have to. They have to build. They have to. They have to build to like a climax." I'm like, "That that was that was a climax." She's like, not the kind of climax. There has to be like a surprise. I'm like, you saw that coming? She's like, no, there has to be, you have to like, the whole thing has to work together. You have to have like clues along with it that build. Then, then there's a moment of revelation and the audience gets to be like, oh my God, like, wow, I, I, I didn't see that coming. I should have seen that coming. Then a moment where they can be impressed, you know? And, 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 and I, I say to her, I'm like, listen, I, I don't know about stories in the UK where you live or here in Australia, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, in North America, which is to say, the United States of America, and Canada, and Mexico, and every island in the Caribbean, every good story ends with a blowjob. She said, no, they don't. I said, oh, yes, they do. I have been to so many one-man shows. And I'll leave there with my friends, and uh, and and we'll we'll look at each other and we'll be like, so what'd you think? What'd you think? And then invariably, someone will be like, well, there there, there wasn't a blowjob, and we'll be like, two stars, you know what I mean? And if there was, it's like five stars, awesome, great, and that's it, that's it. It's like it's very easy. It's very easy to do shows in North America. I tell her, very easy. It's all you got to do. And she's like, no, 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 you don't know anything about storytelling. And let me tell you, it, 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 it this becomes our debate, but it's a very difficult debate to win. When you, who's performing a storytelling show to houses that are meager, are debating about who knows better about storytelling with someone who's routinely selling out their very large houses. But as I said before, we should not judge the, the merits of a storyteller by whether they're selling out their houses. We gotta look beyond it. We gotta look, see what sort of character they possess and, 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 and what, how they are able to cope with uh, their, their show's uh, run not going as planned. And I wish in this instance that I, I could say that I, I, uh, my run was going well outside of my run, but, um, but, it, but it, it wasn't. Uh, uh, while Philip and Deborah were uh, staying in, in a, a, a nice apartment, uh, like separate bedrooms and like a kitchenette and like a living room and a balcony that we were hanging out on, I was, uh, I was staying a 40 minutes walk away in, in a youth hostel that had a very liberal definition of youth. Uh, and I wasn't staying in a private uh, room. I was uh, staying in an all-male 10 
bed dorm room. If I can brag about one thing, though, it's, it, it is that I, uh, I, I had a bottom bunk and I was uh, in the corner, meaning I had two walls. Well, there are many people in the room. Just had one, leaving them more open to attack than me. And under attack, we were, as it turned out, one morning when someone in a bed at the far corner away from me woke up and said that in the night he'd been attacked by bed bugs. He then switched rooms. Did I switch rooms? No, no. I just watched as others in the room also watched as this invisible army of bed bucks slowly made its way across the room, devouring one sleeping body after another until I as well woke up one morning with welts the size of quarters on my body. Did I switch rooms then? No, I did not because I just wanted to make sure until the next day I did and I switched rooms to another all male 10 bed dorm room. And a few nights after that, we were woken up in the middle of the night by a fire alarm. And for those of you who've seen earlier iterations of this show, you might recall in the uh, January edition, I described how I am a bit excitable around fire alarms. Well, not anymore, not as an adult, not in Adelaide when this alarm went off in the middle of the night. And I thought, no, 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 no. I am not overreacting to this. I'm gonna let someone else deal with this. Uh, there are nine other people in this room. Well, apparently those nine other people were thinking the same exact thing that I was thinking. And we were all engaged in a game of chicken. It's not a single person moved, not even a bit. It's this fire alarm just continued to go for a good solid 15 minutes until finally someone close to the door got up and left as I thought, great, finally, thank you. And they did not come back. 10 minutes went by. That's 25 minutes of a fire alarm going off until finally I thought, well, it's always me that's got to play the hero. So I got up, you know, and I was like, all right, I'll take care of it, which is, I didn't say that, but I was hoping that people could read my mind. Uh, and, and then I walked out of the room and walked to the top of the stairs at the end of the hallway and looked down the stairs and I saw there were wisps of smoke. Uh, and I thought, oh, oh, there's a fire. So I turned around, came back to our room. I opened the door, turned on the lights. I said, hey, everybody, don't know if you've noticed, but uh, there's a fire alarm going off because there's a fire. And I think everybody should go. And so everybody everybody did. Everyone got up and they, and they left. And I think because I thought I had special status because I was the hero, because I had gone and I had extra information they had. I had seen the wisps of smoke myself. I therefore... Um, took my time in leaving. I packed my computer into my bag and I realized, no, I actually don't want anything to burn up. So I packed everything, my entire months of, of possessions into my huge camping backpack that was two thirds the length of me and, and it, it felt like twice the weight. And, and I was the last person in the room when I left, walked down the hall, got to the top of the stairs and saw below, it's just thick now with smoke and I was like oh oh I can no longer um, exit uh, that way so I turned around and I walked back down the hallway and walked out onto a balcony and below me the entire hostel I was the last one inside and we had this sort of awkward conversation because like we're just far enough away from each other we can't quite hear each other and I don't really know any of them that well anyway and I'm just sitting there with my huge bag like it's obvious why I have not escaped with everybody else and the fire department comes and the big brawny men who are just coming from like a, a calendar shoot and they've they come inside and they put the fire out and and if somebody like left a candle on and lit somebody's curtain you know and they put it out and then and then the only thing left to do was to save me uh which meant uh sending up a ladder um to get me but uh, i was i was on the second floor um i was certain that if i needed to i could jump 
down. It was, if I dangled, maybe I'd be about five feet off the ground. There's not one moment during this entire episode that I fear for my life, but of course I now had to wait for someone to, to, to save me and to, to send up the ladder. Uh, I say up. This ladder was just about horizontal. My balcony only slightly higher than the top of the fire truck, and then the, the handsome young man had to like hold onto my hip and guide me down and tell me where to put my if you've ever gone down a ladder, you understand the difficulty I experienced going down the ladder. Wouldn't say not difficult, not difficult at all. But then at the bottom, of course, I had to thank him for saving my life because I'm not a monster, you know. And he was like, "Oh, it's nothing. It's just my job," and you know, which is what he is saying. I'm like, I hate this, but I, I can't, I, I can't even indicate that I hate this because I'd be a jerk if I was like being sarcastic with him. You know what I mean? Like that's not good. And so I, I had to thank him, and then everyone's. Applauds. I'm like, uh, you know, and then I and then I can't go back in the hospital. I've got my huge bag. I got to carry around for the rest of the day before I go off and do my last week of performances. Seven performances left. It can't go by fast enough. But when I after I perform my seventh to last performance, I return to my dressing room, which is really just a shipping container that they've gussied up by adding a table and a chair. So uh, uh, I, I find there uh, something uh, miraculous. I, I, I've made clear I'm not a religious person, but I don't know how else to describe this miracle. Uh, an envelope with my name on it and the name of my show. Apparently it had been delivered to the front office of the Garden of Unearthly Delights and then a technician had then delivered it by hand to my uh, dressing room and I uh, opened up the envelope and saw inside uh, something I thought only existed in legend. A handwritten bona fide piece of fan mail. From a woman named Erin, who wrote that she saw my show and she loved it, with loved underlined twice. In the envelope, there was a small gift as well. It was a, a purple, uh, ornate, metallic butterfly attached to a magnet, meaning I could uh, attach it to the metal walls of my shipping container uh, dressing room. And uh, next to that, I taped up the letter and I called in my three friends who were now my friends. And I said to them, well, you may nightly have packed houses who uh, love to uh, and each one of your shows with a round of applause and adulation, but has any one of them taken the time to put pen to paper and travel to a dollar store to tell you how much your show has meant to them? I hope uh, what I admit to next uh, will not make you think that uh, I have an overblown ego. I would hope that everything I've said so far in the show would make you think I don't. Um, I think that what I'm going to say next should instead make it clear that I have a very run-of-the-mill male ego in that to Aaron I attributed all the very best qualities a woman could possibly have. I imagined her as beautiful, but a simple beauty. Nothing showy, made up. I, she was smart. Of course she was. She liked my show. I imagined her as kind, uh, as empathetic, as, uh, as, as a bit retiring, a bit shy. She didn't want to come up to me in person, but forthright enough that she wrote out her thoughts and feelings and then uh, followed through and mailed them to me. She was someone who had a heart, who understood that someone like myself might need to know that there was someone out there who saw the truth and the beauty in what I was conveying. I didn't say any of that. 
to my friends, but they were well aware that I had a run of the mill male ego, and they were like, not to burst your bubble, but have you at all considered that, you know, judging from the handwriting and the tone and the content of the letter, as well as the parchment upon which it is written, that Aaron might be nine years old at most. <laughs> and no, I not considered it at all. I, I, I no, this of course not. Now I, I, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise to you to find out that I have saved this letter, that I have photographed it, that I have turned it into a JPEG so that I may show it to you right now so that you might apply your own analytical skills. You might uh, perform your own sort of forensic tests upon it to determine whether or not Aaron was a child. Uh, here, let's look at it together and I'll read it. Okay, first of all, yeah, sure, the, the paper it's written on, but I don't know, we, we've all, we, you just grab the closest thing you can get when you, when, when, when you gotta write something down, you know what I mean? That's fine, and I like flowers and stuff. It says, Dear Martin, I saw your show and I loved it. You're amazing. And for those of you out there, okay, who are focusing on the misspelling of the word your, instead of, uh, Focusing on the word amazing, shame on you. Shame on you. I was the girl in the blue dress who smiled at you at the end. Uh, I, I stand by the exit after my show. I thank people for coming. And, um, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, people of South Australia, they're not monsters. Even if they didn't like the show, they're going to smile back at me and they're going to say thank you. I don't remember specifically a girl in a blue dress smiling uh, at me. Today I stumbled across a butterfly on a magnet and I thought of you and had to get it for you. I'm sure you will know why it reminded me of you. Signed, Aaron, and then either that's a heart or a butterfly. Um, now one of the, uh, one of the, one of the gifts that the butterflies have given to mankind is, is, is one of poetry. It, it, they've offered themselves up as the perfect, most bulletproof metaphor around. You can apply something about the butterfly to any situation and, and, and tease out the metaphor therein of metamorphosis, of beauty, of fragility, whatever you want. And yet, despite that, I, I can't really quite deduce why Erin thought of me with a butterfly, but I'm certain that if she were standing in front of me, she would be able to explain it, and then I would readily understand it. Uh, and yeah, so maybe, maybe I am thinking she's younger than I'd initially thought. Uh, but I say to my friends, you know what? I mean, a person is a person. If she's a child and she enjoyed my... Look, we all talk about, like, developing audiences for the future. Maybe that's just... What I'm doing here with, with lovely little Aaron. Um, the next day, with six days left of the festival, I perform my sixth to last show. And then I return to my dressing room uh, where I'm surprised to find that another uh, letter has been delivered to the front office of the Garden of Unearthly Delights and then hand delivered by a technician back to my dressing room. Uh, at this time, uh, with another gift, a small plastic wind up ladybug, uh, the kind of toy that you might find on the shelf of a nine year old uh, girl. Uh, but I open it up and I take out the letter and uh, let's read it um, together. It says, Dear Martin, I Hope you got my letter. I thought I would write again because I found a ladybug on a, uh, in a shop today and it also reminded me of your show or at least how I felt when I saw it. 
followed by an ellipsis. So I think we all know that ellipsis uh, is the grammatical way of saying use your imagination. Normally an ellipsis is just three periods. This is five periods, which is really asking me to use my imagination as to why she got me this ladybug. Ah, ah. Your show has made me want to travel. I would have to get time off work which might be hard, but someone told me it is easy to get nursing work anywhere. I am a nurse, I forgot to say. Uh, look, again, it's just a run-of-the-mill male ego, but honestly, if, if, if you've got to imagine that someone has any profession in the world and you're a guy, why not have the female be a nurse? It just, it taps into, it's again, it's, it's, I'm not being creative here, but I can't help it. You know, it, it implies that this, this is a, a woman who's, who, who cares for other people, puts other people in front of themselves. It's someone who's not afraid of bodily fluids. Someone who will be there for uh, you. Um, and I, and, 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 and I, and I point to this to my friends and I'm like, aha, aha, not, not nine years old. She has a job. She writes, anyway, thanks for inspiring me. You're so talented. Again, if you're focusing on your and not so talented, ah, I have told all my friends to go to your show. Good luck with it, Aaron. Uh, that's a heart. P.S. I will try to come to your show again if my shifts work. And uh, with with a great sense of victory, I show this letter to my friends. I tape it to the wall next to the other letter. Uh, put the present next to the other present. And again, my friends are like, hey, not to burst your bubble, okay? But, y you know, uh, nurses come in all ages. Who's to say this is not a grandmotherly nurse, which is great. That's great. Grandmotherly nurses and matronly nurses are, are needed and necessary, but they know that this is not what I have been imagining. I didn't even, it didn't even enter my mind that, the, that possibility. And I was like, right, looking at the tone, I'm like, yeah, this is probably written by someone older who, who who found me cute in a grandson sort of way um and i go home the next day i've got five days left of the festival i perform my fifth to last show and when i get back to my dressing room i am surprised to find there is another letter accompanied by another gift uh, uh, uh like a sleeve of oreo cookies and um uh, uh, let's read the letter together. It says, uh, hi, Martin. I hope you don't think I'm too forward writing to you every day, but you will soon be gone and Fringe will be over and Adelaide and my life will be boring again unless I get up the courage to go to Africa. <laughs> That's, I mean, you know. Look, when when you you know what it's like when you when you've got little like you like someone you let things go you let them go it's okay we've all been there you know you, whatever you're developing little feelings you're like ah everything's cute to everyone else they're like uh, no but to you cute whatever just to let you know I have tomorrow off and so I'm going on an excursion to the zoo with some nurses and trainee doctors some so wild they should live there and I point to this and I say to my friends we're not talking about someone's grandmother here this is a nurse going out with her trainee doctors her peers this is someone who doesn't have to check in and get a babysitter because she's got a family no she's she's free and she's going to the zoo because she loves animals the pandas are a big thing in adelaide as they have only been here a couple of years and they are australia's only giant pandas if you're interested in seeing them We'll be at the pandas at 3.30 p.m. At around 3.30 p.m. Bring friends if you like. If you're not interested, no worries. But I thought it might be the kind of thing you'd like. Hope the show's going well. Aaron, a heart. P.S. Cookies are in case you're missing home. And I'm like, oh my God, uh, we have a date. <laughs> 
And my friends are like, are you, you're going to go, you're going to go, you got to, you got to go, you got to go and meet her. And I'm like, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. They're like, what do you mean? You're not sure. And, and I'm like, I, I don't know. I got to think about this. And, and the thing, and, and I, I go home and I'm, I just ruminate on this. I want to go, but there's also a part of me. It's like, you know, I'm not a celebrity, you know, I mean, certainly you know that, right? But Aaron doesn't know that. What is a celebrity? A celebrity who's somebody who's larger than life. It's someone that you've watched their movies, their TV show. You've listened to them sing. You've spent time with them that they haven't spent with you. And you've developed a, a thought, an idea, an impression of who they are. And if I were to meet up with Erin, I would be terribly self-conscious to live up to whatever image she might have of me. God forbid I don't live up to it. God forbid I can feel her impression of me crumbling in front of me as she's realizing, oh, you are not at all like what you are on stage, but just as awkward as if I do live up to it. And she's like, oh my God, he is every bit the man I imagined him to be. That the, that the, the very quickly her feelings would get confused with 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 love, uh, which is not possible, our status is is out of whack. She has an image of me, I, and, and and then like what? We're good. The night will go a certain way, and 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 I'm susceptible to a, a pretty woman who is into me, and I, I I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to hook up with her and sleep with her, and then and then and then and then like realize that no, I'm going home, and and this is just because you like me and I and, and, and am I taking advantage of that and I I could be that guy like I, you know all of us could be that guy the way to not be that guy is to not meet up with uh, with her you know because the truth is as much as I have to live up to a certain image I I also want Aaron to live up to a certain image I don't want to meet up with her and find out that she is not the perfect woman, which of course she wouldn't be, right? I want her to stay in this perfect form. I want her to be everything that I need her to be. I want her to be this presence out there that I can't see. I want her to be someone who's uh, keeping track of what I'm doing. I want her to be someone who cares unmitigated by anything if you're wondering am i am i am i calling Aaron by another name god well yeah, then maybe maybe i am and and you know if god ever invites you to meet him or her at the zoo to see the pandas don't go you know because god forbid they do not live up to what you want you know what if they don't wipe their face after eating a taco. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, what if they just mess the... Uh, who knows, right? And they don't live up to it. Unlike Aaron, who can be everything and anything to me. And like, I made it through those 18 times 52 different masses without ever really uh, buying into the whole idea of God and religion, but it's amazing what being at your lowest point, you know, can suddenly make you appreciate the idea that there is an energy and a presence out there who is watching out for you, who cares for you, and who loves you. Erin can be everything. She could be anything, anything at all right now. And if not God, she could be a time traveler. Who is, who is leaving me clues with each letter that I can only now in 2021 begin to understand. That, that she, she was letting me know in, in very subtle ways, planting seeds to let me know that someday I, I, I'll, I'll be happier. This will all be a thing of the past. You know, my daughter who's turning three on Monday, her very first word, you know what it was? Cat. She pointed at a cat and she said, cat. And Vanessa and I, we lost our minds. And we're like, oh my God, she speaks. Perhaps we celebrated a bit too much because uh, our daughter proceeded to point at everything and, 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 and say cat. 
our poor daughter, who must have been elated to feel she'd unlocked so easily the key to the English language in that there's just one word for everything. So, of course, her first word has been demoted, as, as it would be when your first word becomes your every word. The first animal word she ever said, as far as I can remember, is butterfly, which she called Bubba. Even now, she has butterflies on her clothes. She has butterflies decorating her room. She gets very excited whenever she sees butterflies. And I know you're thinking, what two-year-old girl doesn't get excited by butterflies? But I tell you, when you're positing that someone uh, is a time traveler, when you're putting forth what is, in effect, a wild theory, you cherry-pick what pieces of information fit your narrative. Look, people, we live in the year 2021. If it's not defined by COVID, it is defined by every single person's right <laughs> that they are routinely expressing to believe in whatever wackadoo conspiracy theory they want to believe in. And I've, I've let all the conspiracies go by. 9-11? No, I just think there's a couple planes, you know, like uh, the, the moon landing. I think they went there. The world is round. Yeah, I buy into that, you know what I mean? COVID, not a hoax. It, it really happened. QAnon? QAnon? All these people believing in it to such an extent that they're buying hats and t-shirts with Q in it and going online and wondering who is Q and it seems very obvious to me that Q is the person selling the t-shirts and the hats. But now I'm understanding, oh, it's not just that people are crazy is that they need something to believe in. They need to believe that there is order and structure, that there's someone more powerful than them who is pulling the strings and that they can see the strings being pulled, putting themselves at the center of a web, a narrative. And so allow me to do that myself. My daughter and I, we read children's books. If you have seen an earlier iteration of this show, let's say back in October, I let you know I don't like children's books all that much. A lot of them are very cloying, very obvious morals at the end. But the book that I've discovered that my daughter and I love together is a book that you open up and it's filled with fantastical drawings of all kinds of animals and within that you're supposed to find a ladybug. And no matter what situation, if I bring that book out, both myself and my little girl instantly happy to read these books, look for ladybug in Plant City, look for ladybug in Ocean City. If there's one cookie that's gotten me through this pandemic, it's the Oreo. Sure, lots of things have gotten me through this pandemic, but it's the Oreo that represents civilization and its continuation. Because a clear thing that will happen should society ever truly fall apart is that we will never see another Oreo cookie for the rest of our lives because it's the one cookie that you cannot make in your own home. I don't know who makes Oreos. The Bisco, maybe, whatever. They alone own the rights to that sludge of white sweetness that flows through their factory that they then squeeze in between two chips that they've gotten off of their sweet shoes. Oreos are the sign that we are going to be okay. And when I'd go to the supermarket here in Montauk, New York, and I'd see Oreos, I'd be like, we're, we're doing just fine. And I dare say that this is who Aaron could have been to me. Someone giving me these indications that one day I would find truth and solace in a completely different life than what I was experiencing there in Adelaide, Australia. All which is to say I decided not to go and meet Aaron at the zoo, knowing that in this decision, 
I might be uh, ending our relationship. This might, in fact, be our first fight together. Um, every relationship ends with a fight, and I suppose it should be no different for Aaron and myself. Uh, the next day, what do we have? Like uh, three days left of performances, if, if, if I haven't lost count. Um, right? Or maybe four, maybe four days left of performances. Anyway, I can finish my fourth letter, but get back to my thing, and there is another letter, okay, waiting for me the next day. And I'm like, oh my God, right? The relationship's not over. This time it comes with a gift, a wrestling doll, still in its package, which is to say a, a very muscular naked man uh, wearing nothing but a very small spandex white briefs. Uh, and again, of course, it comes with another letter, which reads, uh, hi, Martin. Uh, didn't see you at the zoo, but the pandas are crowded and beautiful. So sorry if I missed you. Uh, uh, you were probably uh, too busy. I read in the paper this morning that you won an award. Congratulations. You deserve it. And it's true. That uh, morning, the largest newspaper in Adelaide had awarded me, to my utter surprise, uh, the award of Best Theater at the Festival, um, which is great. The only downside of it is that the newspaper is called The Advertiser, which makes it very difficult to advertise anything written in it in other cities and at other festivals because it looks like you were awarded whatever you were awarded by the advertising section of another paper. But to the people in Adelaide, it, it's real news. And so my show sold out finally. This, and it was filled with people who wanted to see a show like the show I was doing. And it's very, so your head spins and there was a sort of great adulation. And then I come back to my dressing room and there's a letter from Aaron herself, Aaron who's been there since the beginning or at least since the beginning of the week. And she writes, I got you this gift to say congratulations. Can you work out why? Aaron and a heart. And then P.S. Sorry, I'm in a rush today, but have been called into work on my night off as we are understaffed. Must remember to quit and go traveling. P.P.S. Go see the pandas if you haven't yet. Uh, they're amazing, but are too lazy to mate. Like my last boyfriend with a smiley face. I didn't think I was the kind of person who could feel uh, that he was in a relationship that was suddenly moving too fast. Uh, for a relationship uh, in which you've never actually uh, met the other person in person, this letter is as close uh, as you can get to having sort of makeup sex after uh, the fight that I thought Aaron and I might have been in by me blowing her off at our uh, proposed date. But oh no, it is uh, uh, fully on. And my friends, they're like, you, you're, you're, you guys are, are going to hook up. You're going to have sex. And I said, no, 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 we're not. And I really did give this some thought. And I thought that uh, we're not. I, I, Aaron might pop out at any moment. She might appear in front of me and I should be ready for this. And we're not going to get an alcoholic drink because alcoholic drinks seem to imply uh, that the night is moving in a certain direction as it is implied all around me at the Garden of Unearthly Delights. And I was like, no, we'll get a Coca-Cola, we'll get some French fries, and then I will sit down and I will talk about travel and I will inspire her to do this. And she will always remember me fondly as the person that uh, got her to go to uh, some other far-flung place from Australia. Got three uh, days left of the festival. The next day, after I perform my third to last show, I return to my dressing room. There is an envelope there, uh, this time with two uh, gifts, one a set of juggling balls and another a packet of onion seeds. And I read the letter and it says, Hi, Martin, I hope you're well and you're still enjoying Adelaide. I forgot to tell you, that my family is originally from New South Wales and were farmers, famous, well, famous uh, amongst other things, for the Hunter Brown River onions. Uh, well, famous in our family anyway. I don't know if you're allowed to take uh, the seeds home to America, but if you can, you uh, plant them in the garden or a window box and then eat them to remind you of Australia. I thought, having uh, watched your show, that it is a very appropriate gift, uh, as you uh, definitely have many layers to be peeled. I mean, finally, somebody's saying it. Everybody has wanted to tell me I have many layers, like an onion, but everyone probably just assumed everybody else was telling me that. No, nobody else has told me that. And only 
Aaron has had the courage to tell me that. And for those who's thinking that's a hackneyed poetic uh, uh, metaphor, uh, well, obviously no one's ever said it to you. Uh, the juggling balls are just for fun. I, I got them at the beginning, uh, at a stall at the Garden of Earthly Delights. It's Unearthly Delights, whatever, she got it wrong. Uh, at the start of the festival, I haven't even opened them yet, so uh, you can enjoy them. Uh, and um, I hope you like this sort of thing. Love, Aaron. Love. She writes, Love, Aaron, and there is a heart. Yeah, you know, like what? All joking aside, what what is what is love? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just like I don't know what comedy is. <laughs> it's something for a performer to admit. Love is some kind of understanding, right? It's something we just feel. It's something you know. It's uh, it's when you feel a communion with another person. It's when you feel that the two of you are together tightly bound in a story and that you share an outlook that reality is reality and you two have decided on what it is and you affirm each other's existence within that reality. It is something private between the two of you. It takes many forms and it's something that Aaron and I had. Love. Like, I loved her. You know, in, not in the way that I was in love with her, but I felt this understanding. I, it was weird, and I liked the weirdness. I don't know who, what Aaron's all about, but I, I, I appreciate this relationship, this perfect relationship where I don't have to do anything to maintain it, you know? I don't have to like try and make someone laugh. I don't have to try and make someone like me. I can just continue being myself in the world, do my thing. And she likewise is, is, is just doing her thing. And we have this understanding and this trust that we're being real with each other. Uh, uh, the next uh, day is, is the second to last day of the festival. I go and I perform uh, my show and then I return to my uh, dressing room. Uh, one more show to, to go and there is um, another letter waiting for me. Uh, and it says, Dear Martin, uh, my dog is sick. Did I tell you I have a brown Springer Spaniel uh, called Lucy? Um, which is stunning because I have a dog named Lucy who's been the most important uh, relationship I'd ever had in my life. I have to uh, take her to the vet, and I'm like, wow, uh, okay, I understand, and like, you know, that would kill me to take my dog to the vet, and, and look after her, otherwise I would come to your show tonight. I've bought a ticket for your show on Sunday, so unless my mom uh, minds Lucy, which she might, I might not get to see any more shows or your show until then, Sunday, which is actually tomorrow the last day of the show, uh, festival tomorrow. I have, uh, I hope you are enjoying the sunshine. I got you some bubbles because you can't keep them in your hand and uh, contain and control their direction, which, uh, which reminds me of your show and you, but I'm sure you would have gotten that on your own love. Aaron Hart, two X's, P.S. I just remember who you remind me of which is a funny way to end the letter. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no doubt I'm going to, Erin will figure out about her dog, figure out about her shifts, and she will be at the show tomorrow. Only thing I'm not sure about is whether she will just stay quietly in the audience. I know I will be performing. I know I will be looking for a woman in a blue dress. I know I will smile at her if I see her and that if she smiles at me in a certain way we will recognize each other and wouldn't it be the most romantic if she doesn't come up after the show if that's it a complete understanding through this 
dis words disassociated from anything physical and just a glance at the end of the run of a show. That night, where I'm out at the Fringe Club, and my friends, they're like, um, hey, there's a secret midnight cabaret back at the Garden of Unearthly Delights, which is already shut down for the evening. Do you want to go? And, and these are my friends now, you know? A, a month later, yes, they're my friends. And I'm like, of course, let's go. And so the four of us, Tommy and Philip and Deborah and a few other people, we make our way uh, from the, the bar where we've been hanging out to the gun, Garden of Unearthly Delights, and we go into a Spiegel tent. Like Spiegel tents are these venues that have traveled across the ocean from Holland. They're a hundred years old. They're made out of wood. Spiegel means mirror, so they're decorated with mirrors that blurs the line between performer and patron. There's stained glass, there's colored lights, and this Spiegel tent has 200 seats. And we go in and we take a seat, and to our surprise, there's not a lot of other people here. In fact, one by one, my friends get up just to make sure we're in the right place, that this is the right night. Until, to my surprise, all of a sudden, I am the only one still sitting in the venue. At which point, the lights begin to dim as I'm looking around me. And this ethereal music begins to play. An artist named Goldfrapp, a song called Utopia. It is sci-fi. It is mysterious. It is seductive. And then a light from a projector shines onto a screen and onto a disco ball and a star field of reflected lights runs across myself, across the audience, across the stage. And a woman's voice comes over the loudspeaker and it says my name. And she says, Martin. And I say, yeah. And she says, are you ready to meet me? And I'm not ready to meet her. No doubt who she is. It's Aaron. But I say, uh, yeah. And then this projector that's shining on a screen projects onto that screen the image of a butterfly, followed by the word butterfly. And then it projects an image of a ladybug, followed by the word ladybug. And then an image of Oreo cookies, followed by the word Oreo. And then a wrestling doll, followed by the word wrestling doll. And then an image of juggling balls, followed by the words juggling balls. And then image of onion, followed by onion seeds. And then, uh, then bubbles, followed by the word bubbles. And then after a moment, all those images disappear, leaving the words behind. And then after another moment, all the letters of those words disappear, leaving just the first letters of each word, and then in a very rudimentary PowerPoint animation, each of those letters falls one at a time from its vertical position into a horizontal line, spelling out the words B L O W J O B blowjob and then a sentence appears underneath it saying because every good story ends with one and then onto the stage come my three friends led by deborah who's holding in her arms a blue dress and my first thought because i'm so married to the reality that i thought i've been living in is why are you all making fun of aaron but that thought crumbles under the realization that this whole thing has been a joke at my expense. It was Deborah's brainchild. She's the one who wrote all the letters. It was her idea. Everyone else knew about it and just went along with it. And there's many people 
who in my position perhaps could be offended, you know, particularly when the person who has the sold out show is, 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 is inventing someone who really likes the show of the person whose show is not selling out. But I'm not offended. Honestly, not. I'm in fact a, a bit flattered that anybody has taken such uh, pains to create this reality. And I love movies and shows where, where reality's flipped on its head. I love having the rug pulled out from underneath me. And wow, you know, has it ever been, I, I, I can't fully wrap my head around it. And then they're laughing. And because they're laughing, I'm laughing. And, and, and I, and you know, and I, I'm, 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 I'm going along with it. But I, if I'm being honest, there's, there's something else underneath this all in my own heart that's very difficult to put into words because there's no analog for it. There's no uh, experience in real life where you feel the, 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 a sort of mourning for the loss of someone that you cared about in your life. Uh, sort of like a death, which of course it isn't because the person never was alive. The person never existed. But of course, all our relationships are just projections of our own imaginations. We uh, concoct collectively this narrative that we are all rolling through and then we lay it down upon the physical world around us. The people that we love, uh, love itself is, is something that can't be put into words. It's just a feeling. Laughter is just a feeling. All these things are just understandings we have with other people and that's exactly what I had with Erin is an understanding that was very real to me and the sadness I feel now is for her and thinking she will never uh, get to travel she will never get to see the pandas in the zoo she will never get to be a nurse she will never uh, get to write these letters to me she'll never get to have a dog named Lucy, who didn't exist either. And it's a real strange sense of loss. I put on the blue dress as we go out, all of us, and go back to the, the bar and there's dancing and I'm wearing the dress. And I'm sure everyone thinks I'm wearing the dress because I'm a good sport, you know, or, or because it's like, oh, it's funny, whatever. And, and while that may be true, there's also a part of me that is wearing this dress as a sort of act of communion with this person. It is our one moment to come together, this figment of my imagination. But aren't we all figments to some extent of each other's imagination? The next day is uh, the final show. It's sold out. It's great. I thank all the people you would thank at the end of a show. And uh, because I'd expected Erin to be at the show, but had wondered whether we would ever actually meet, I thank her just the same because she is at the show in my mind. And even now when I think back to Adelaide, and I, 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 I still think of Erin as someone who was there, who lifted me up when I was at my lowest point. I understand now, in a way I never could have before, how people gravitate towards uh, higher powers at their lowest points and how difficult it must be when they wake up one day to find out that, oh, it was all a charade. If anything, Aaron has served as the sort of the foundation, as the model of a, a relationship uh, that I now have with you out there, the collective you. Some of you I know, some of you I've met, some of you I don't know, some of you I'll never meet. But you as a collective have been a presence in my life that has had great importance to me over the past year. And I would like to think that I've played some uh, role in your lives as well, that this is a relationship that is as strange and yet as real as the relationship I had with Aaron, and that we do not share a physical space, but we do share some energy.
some projections of our minds. We are there for each other. Certainly you've been there. For me, you've given me a purpose through what has been a, a strange uh, year for all of us. And I hope that likewise, I have been a constant for you uh, performing these shows every five to six weeks since uh, last August. And someday, someday in the not too distant future, all this will be over. The pandemic will have passed and this show will also be a thing of the past that will have served its purpose, that will have run its course. I said before, every relationship ends with a fight, but that's not true. And our relationship, as some relationships can, will end with the knowledge that it's run its course, that we've been there and that we can leave each other knowing that we loved each other in a certain way. And that should we see each other again in the future at other shows like this or wherever, we'll fondly recall this relationship we had, a special relationship that nobody else knows about. This is, this is not for anyone else. This is just for us. And I thank you very much for having been here this past year. I'm not breaking up with you not just yet, but we're getting close to the end, which, which is all right. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for, for watching uh, this show again. Even if this is your first time ever watching or you've been here since last August, uh, I love you collectively. And, um, you know, uh, Things are opening up and things are things are going to be all right. Uh, thank you very much. Again, if you enjoyed the show, uh, let me know. Um, if you feel like contributing some money, uh, this is the only uh, job that I uh, know how to do. Normally, I'm touring around, but festivals won't be back up and running until 2022. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, I'll still be here. But um, even if you aren't in a position to contribute, just uh, send me a message, click like, um, and uh, let other, someone else know about this show. And uh, uh, again, I thank you so much for, for being here. And I'll see you next time. And, um, you know, there'll be some uh, little credits about where you can contribute money. I'll still be sitting here. I don't know if you can hear the crickets in the background, but they're far away, but they're emerging. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And um, really, have a good night.